Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining today. Uh, my name is Vicki Lipnick. I am a, a partner at Resolution Economics, and where I head our human capital consulting group. Uh, but I'm also a former commissioner and acting chair of the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Uh, I joined Resolution Economics in the spring of this year, but uh, that was after a decade of service at the EEOC. And uh, I'm here to talk to you today a little bit about uh, what the EOC does, the history of the EOC, how it operates, uh, the laws that it enforces. Uh, prior to my joining Resolution Economics uh, and prior to my being at the EEOC, I was also an Assistant Secretary of Labor uh, during the Bush administration. And uh, so areas like uh, wage and hour, uh, EEO compliance for the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs were also part of my uh, portfolio. Uh, my background is in labor and employment law uh, and in civil rights, uh, and I'm very passionate about issues related to the workforce. I've spent my career dedicated to issues uh, related to the workforce. So I'm happy to have the chance to talk to you today uh, about the EEOC and the work that it does uh, in ensuring that uh, our federal laws uh, make sure that people are not discriminated against in their workplaces. Um, <clears throat> of course, there are many, many uh, treatises and legal articles and books uh, that have been written about the EEOC uh, over the past 57 years, which is how long the commission has been in existence. Uh, so this is going to be a very condensed version of uh, helping you to learn a little bit about what the EOC does. Uh, of course, for the past year, so many of us have been uh, learning about the civil rights history uh, in our country, so much more so, and uh, particularly after uh, the protests of last summer, uh, there's so much more interest in, and I certainly think rightly so, uh, our civil rights history and uh, a lot of thought being given to uh, both where we've been and uh, where we need to go. Uh, I'm someone who passionately believes in uh, studying history and, and wanting to have a good understanding of what our history is to uh, understand not just where we want to go, but why we want to go uh, in certain directions. So um, I'm going to start with giving you just a little bit of history about how <clears throat> the EOC uh, and really our civil rights history uh, came about in the what I would call the modern era. So um, let's start, actually, uh, with World War II, uh, which seems probably like an unusual place to start. But uh, during World War II, of course, as uh, so many uh, people went off to fight in the war. There were a lot of uh, jobs that opened up on the home front, uh, particularly in manufacturing, to uh, make sure that the war effort was uh, had the supplies that it needed. And many of those jobs then uh, were filled by both women uh, and also, um, particularly in the South, uh, in the industrial settings, uh, by African Americans. Uh, and then, uh, of course, there were many, many uh, African-American troops who went off to fight uh, in the war, and uh, they were ending up in segregated military units. So uh, in the early 1940s, one of the early labor leaders and very prominent labor leader in the United States, uh, A. Philip Randolph, who was the head of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. He was a labor leader who had organized that labor union, uh, really uh, petitioned uh, President Franklin Roosevelt to make sure that there was not discrimination in employment and that there were opportunities for African Americans to uh, both be employed uh, and continue to have jobs uh, both during the war effort and then afterwards. And he um, actually threatened uh, President Roosevelt that he was going to organize uh, a march on Washington. Uh, this is, uh, again, in the 1940s uh, for jobs and uh, justice. That ended up uh, then with President Roosevelt issuing an executive order. And this is really the first executive order really in our sort of modern history uh, having to deal with uh, non-discrimination discrimination 
uh, in employment. And so uh, President Roosevelt's executive order prohibited discrimination in employment uh, for workers in the defense industry and in government because of uh, race, creed, color, or national origin. So race, creed, color, or national origin. So that uh, then becomes the precursor for uh, a lot of things that then happen uh, in the civil rights movement, particularly related to employment uh, in later years, and particularly in the 1960s. So following uh, World War II then, uh, as of course uh, many African Americans return to the home front, uh, or again trying to get jobs, uh, this was an important executive order, especially, like I said, in the defense industry, so in the industrial settings. By 1948, then, President Harry Truman issued another executive order. This one was to desegregate, <clears throat> excuse me, the United States military. That was another step, important step, in uh, our civil rights history. And then, of course, uh, in the 1950s, particularly in the South, uh, the civil rights movement really started to pick up a lot of steam. Uh, of course, there's the very famous Montgomery bus boycott uh, that takes place in Montgomery, Alabama in the middle of the 1950s. Uh, that is, uh, at that time, led by a very young uh, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. And of course, uh, quite famously, uh, Rosa Parks uh, uh, refuses to give up her seat on the segregated buses uh, in Montgomery, Alabama. That leads to the boycott uh, that has a really powerful effect in terms of uh, moving the civil rights movement forward and then also uh, ensuring that, uh, or really getting things started in terms of uh, uh, a lot of attention being paid to uh, civil rights and opportunities in particular uh, for African Americans. So, Progress from the 1950s. Uh, I should add that uh, in the 1950s, actually, that's the first time that uh, President Eisenhower then ends up signing uh, the civil rights a civil rights bill in the 1950s, and that's the first major civil rights legislation uh, in the United States since the Civil War. So you have uh, President Roosevelt's executive orders, or his one executive order. You have uh, President Truman's executive order. And then we get to uh, President Eisenhower, and there's a civil rights bill in the 1950s. Progress then to the 1960s, and uh, I'm actually in Washington, D.C., uh, coming to you from Washington, D.C. But from here, uh, in, in, of course, 1963, we have now the very famous uh, Washington, uh, the March on Washington in August of 1963. And when that happens, <clears throat> and I should add that um, a. Philip Randolph, the labor leader who uh, I mentioned earlier as one of the prime organizers of that uh, 1963 March on Washington. And when that happens, then uh, of course that's a really galvanizing moment for the civil rights movement uh, in the country. And uh, quite famously, of course, uh, Martin Luther King gives his I Have a Dream speech uh, at the Lincoln Memorial. <clears throat> Now, after that, uh, and also I should add, uh, John Lewis, a very young uh, John Lewis, is one of the speakers uh, at the uh, March on Washington. The March on Washington uh, was actually similar to what uh, A. Philip Randolph had wanted in the 1940s, a march for jobs and justice. So um, again, uh, the civil rights movement is really picking up steam. Uh, a month later, uh, tragically, there is a, a bombing in Birmingham, Alabama, at the 16th Street Baptist Church, where uh, six or where four young girls uh, were killed. And uh, after that, uh, President Kennedy really takes up uh, the mantle of civil rights, and uh, there's work that begins on a, a new civil rights bill in Congress. Uh, of course, tragically, then, uh, President Kennedy is assassinated in November of that year. And President Johnson then, Lyndon Johnson, makes it a real priority when he becomes president to pass civil rights legislation. So by uh, July of 1964, uh, after some very famous uh, legislative maneuvering uh, by President Johnson, and uh, this is, of course, uh, 
Um, most of us um, aren't used to this kind of legislative maneuvering today, but President Johnson had been the Senate Majority Leader. So uh, he is able to uh, get passed in Congress with uh, bipartisan support, although, like I said, a lot of legislative wrangling, uh, a new civil rights bill. And uh, so this is the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And this is probably uh, one of the most uh, famous and uh, really uh, transformative uh, pieces of legislation uh, that the country has uh, ever seen. And uh, the Civil Rights Bill in 1964 covers many aspects, uh, <clears throat> including uh, making sure that there is non-discrimination in public accommodations. But one of the most uh, really enduring parts of uh, the Civil Rights Bill of 1964 is what's known as Title VII. And uh, Title VII, it's always done in Roman numerals. Uh, Title VII is the provision that applies to employment. And so uh, in creating uh, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1974, uh, that ensures that uh, there will be non-discrimination in employment uh, for individuals and uh, and that they cannot be discriminated against based on their race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Now, um, and then that is also uh, the piece of legislation that creates uh, the EOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. So the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, uh, after, after the legislation is signed in July of 1964, and there's a famous photograph of President Johnson signing that bill in 1964, uh, after uh, the, the, it takes a year for uh, the EOC to get up and running, uh, actually the very first uh, chairman of the EOC was uh, President Roosevelt's uh, son, Franklin Roosevelt Jr. And um, <clears throat> after the EOC gets up and running in 1965, then it's uh, organized in a way to uh, really um, start to have an impact uh, in employment and uh, to make sure that uh, that there is not, or to try to ensure that there is not uh, discrimination uh, in employment. Now, uh, when the EOC was um, first established, uh, one of the things that it did not have uh, when it was first established was um, litigation authority. So the idea uh, at first was that the EOC would be able to try to negotiate uh, agreements and settlements between uh, the parties, between employers and uh, individuals who uh, believed that they had been discriminated against. Uh, that proved to be a not uh, the most effective way for the legislation to operate. And so by 1972, uh, the, EOC, the statute itself was amended and the EOC was given litigation authority, and that put some real teeth uh, into the law where uh, it probably had not existed uh, quite before then. Um, what the law specifically says uh, is that um, individuals cannot, or, or that, um, it's, uh, that it is an unlawful uh, employment practice uh, for an employer to, and I'm quoting here, fail or refuse to hire or to discharge any individual or otherwise to discriminate against any individual with respect to his compensation, terms, conditions, or privileges of employment because of such individuals, again, race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Uh, now, this may come as a surprise to many people today, but uh, the prohibition that employers could not discriminate based on sex was, in fact, added at the last minute uh, in the statute. Uh, there had been uh, an effort by a number of uh, women members of Congress, and at that time there was only a handful of uh, women members of Congress. There were two women in the United States Senate, and I think there were about uh, 17 uh, or 15 in the uh, U.S. House of Representatives. And uh, they were uh, able to have uh, sex added in as one of the protected classes uh, by which people could not be discriminated against. Uh, 
there's a lot of uh, history about whether or not sex was added in as a poison pill to the legislation. It, it was actually, the amendment was offered by a congressman from Virginia who had been an avowed segregationist, and there was a lot of uh, uh, thought for a long time that he had added this uh, to really bring down the entire civil rights bill. That history is, um, uh, there's been some more uh, recent review of that, and uh, it's not entirely uh, sure whether uh, that was his real intent. In fact, uh, that congressman from Virginia had been a friend of Alice Paul, who was one of the very famous uh, suffragists. And uh, so uh, whether or not he was trying to uh, defeat the entire civil rights bill uh, by adding in that as an amendment uh, is probably a bit of an open question. I'm not sure people uh, necessarily agree with that uh, interpretation uh, today. Nevertheless, uh, the women members of Congress, both in the House and the, the two women uh, members in the Senate, particularly uh, Margaret Chase Smith, who was a senator from Maine, uh, were successful in uh, having sex added in as one of the protected bases. And so, um, Certainly that uh, really transformed the employment landscape, uh, particularly for women, uh, in addition to uh, the prohibition, particularly based on race. Um, in fact, when uh, the EOC then opened its doors uh, in 1965, as I said, uh, the commission was really stunned by not only how many complaints of discrimination that it received initially, uh, based on race in particular, uh, but one third of the initial uh, complaints that were filed with the EOC uh, in that first year were based on sex. And uh, so much so, in fact, that some uh, uh, members of Congress at the time and some members of the commission uh, actually would have um, wanted to try to go back to Congress and have uh, sex taken out as one of the protected bases. In addition to uh, the uh, terms and the uh, prohibition about uh, uh, not being discriminated against uh, in your employment, and as I said, uh, the terms and conditions of your employment. So that includes, terms and conditions include uh, things like how you are treated at work. Uh, do you suffer harassment at work? Uh, and uh, so, uh, but in addition to that, uh, the other uh, important provision for in terms of people's working lives uh, that the statute provides for is that it also makes it an unlawful employment practice for uh, any employer to discriminate against employees or applicants for employment uh, because uh, they have opposed any practice that is made an unlawful, unlawful employment practice or because they've made a charge or testified or assisted or participated in an investigation um, under the law. So in other words, uh, you cannot be retaliated against uh, because you have either filed a complaint of discrimination, because you've complained to your employer about it, uh, because you've gone to the EOC about it. Uh, that is something that uh, is also prohibited by the law. And so uh, just to give you an example of that, what would retaliation look like? So uh, let's say that you are someone who regularly works overtime and uh, you like the overtime hours, you like the extra money that you get from the overtime hours, and, uh, <clears throat> but you have um, agreed to participate. Uh, a friend of yours has filed a complaint uh, of discrimination and uh, you've uh, been part of the investigation and you've corroborated uh, some of the evidence or testimony that uh, your friend has provided. And then all of a sudden your overtime hours are cut. Uh, the employer decides you don't, you don't have to have those overtime hours anymore. So that's, but that would be potentially an indication of retaliation uh, in your workplace. And that would be something that is prohibited uh, by Title VII. So I want to talk to you a little bit about process uh, in terms of uh, as an employee and, and employer uh, dealing with the EEOC. So um, first of all, 
Uh, of course, the EOC is um, a uh, semi-independent commission. Uh, it is uh, the governing body is made up of five commissioners, uh, all of whom are appointed by the president and uh, confirmed by the U.S. Senate. Uh, as I mentioned, I served as one of the commissioners there for a decade and also as the uh, acting chair. And uh, But the EOC structurally uh, has 53 offices all around the country uh, in, uh, and 15 uh, major district offices in all the major cities in the country. And so if you... Uh, believe that you are a victim of discrimination or have experienced some discrimination in your workplace, then uh, you can file what's called a charge. I, I was referring to complaints before, but uh, technically they're called charges of discrimination uh, at any one of the uh, 53 offices uh, around the country. And of course, uh, there are lots of resources uh, on the EEOC's website uh, to tell you how to file a charge and where to go. Uh, <clears throat> like many uh, employers over the past year, the EOC has been uh, operating largely uh, through telework. So, and in fact, I think I just saw uh, that they're uh, looking for public comment about uh, the safe way to return to offices. But they have been able to uh, certainly uh, accept charges and uh, do the work uh, that they need to do for people to be able to take advantage of the EOC's resources. So the first step is uh, to go to uh, one of the offices and uh, you can, uh, where you would meet with uh, uh, what's called an uh, intake uh, investigator. And so uh, that person would uh, take down your information and uh, ask you about uh, the circumstances under which you think you've been discriminated against. Uh, who your employer is, uh, basically get uh, the facts. And um, <clears throat> they're not making a judgment at that point. They're just, uh, like I said, gathering the facts. And so uh, you would then, uh, after they would go over that with you and tell you about uh, the laws and uh, whether or not it applies. So, for example, uh, Title Seven. Uh, only applies to uh, employers who have 15 or more employees. Now, um, there are various state laws that also uh, prohibit discrimination, and those tend to have lower uh, employee thresholds uh, So, uh, for coverage purposes, but for federal law purposes, uh, Title VII only applies to employers who have 15 or more employees. So if you go to one of the district offices and you file a charge of discrimination, then, um, <clears throat> uh, like I said, and the, they do the fact gathering, then the, the uh, EEOC office will notify your employer uh, that you've filed that charge. And this becomes where, as I was uh, mentioning earlier, the retaliation provision is uh, particularly important in the law because uh, at that point we want to make sure that you do not suffer uh, retaliation in your workplace for having filed that uh, discrimination complaint. But once you file that, then the first thing the EOC will do is ask if you are interested in mediating, uh, so in having a discussion uh, with your employer, which the EOC would oversee, and, um, and to try to resolve this uh, discrimination complaint. Now, the mediation has to be agreed to by both parties. So uh, as an individual employee, you might want to mediate, uh, but your employer may not be interested in doing so. Or uh, vice versa, you, the employee, may not be interested uh, in mediation. I should add that uh, the EOC has uh, very experienced mediators, and they uh, really have a, for people who participate in mediation, have a very high success rate uh, in uh, getting a resolution. And uh, oftentimes uh, that can be uh, certainly much more uh, expeditious uh, in terms of resolving uh, the matter uh, at work and uh, oftentimes can be uh, uh, beneficial to both parties, both the employee and the employer. Uh, <clears throat> it may be the case that uh, depending on what the charge is of discrimination that the employer has been unaware of what the situation is. And so uh, the mediation can be certainly very helpful to uh, 
uh, enlighten the employer about uh, the circumstances that may be taking place in a particular workplace. If uh, the mediation is not successful or uh, if the parties aren't interested, both parties aren't interested in uh, mediation, then the next step is the EOC goes to uh, an investigation. And now there are um, sort of levels of investigation depending upon uh, how much uh, uh, the EOC, and these are very experienced and trained investigators, uh, see in terms of uh, the, the uh, potential discrimination that's there. So, uh, the, but the investigation stage is when the EOC starts to really gather evidence. Uh, they will ask uh, you as an employee for any documentary evidence you might have. They will uh, ask to talk to witnesses. Uh, <clears throat> that may include coworkers. And uh, they will also uh, get what's known as a, a position statement from the employer uh, where the employer will respond to your allegations of discrimination. And those are often uh, uh, employers pretty much uh, almost always will have those uh, prepared by uh, a, either their in-house counsel or uh, outside attorneys. And uh, the uh, position statement is then given to the EOC, which they will then uh, use that as part of uh, their investigation as well. At the conclusion of the investigation, and, and uh, depending upon uh, what the allegations are about discrimination, that can take some time. Uh, there's always a lot of uh, charges of discrimination coming into the EOC. Uh, when I first joined the EOC back in uh, 2010, uh, at that point in time, and of course this was uh, during the Great Recession, uh, there were close to 100,000 charges of discrimination being filed every year uh, with the EOC. Um, <clears throat> that's dropped over the past few years, and the EOC has done a, a pretty good job of uh, really addressing the aged cases that uh, in their inventory, the backlog of their inventory. Uh, but the investigation process itself, and uh, the EOC will advise uh, the charging party about this, of uh, the steps along the way, uh, can take some time. And uh, once the investigation is concluded, though, the EOC makes a determination at that point, um, and they issue what's called a letter of determination. And they make a determination as to whether or not they think it is more likely or not that uh, discrimination has occurred. And um, <clears throat> at that point, uh, the EOC is required uh, by statute to attempt to uh, conciliate the matter. Now, conciliation is a little bit different than mediation, although uh, it has a lot of the same elements to it. Uh, but in a conciliation, uh, at that point, there's been this finding uh, uh, based on the initial charge by the EOC. So, uh, and there's been this investigation, and so there's been uh, evidence that's been accumulated. So at that point, the EOC is uh, then trying to uh, work out an agreement uh, between the employer and the charging party, and there can always be more than one charging party. Uh, so they're trying to work out an agreement at that point so that uh, this it resolves uh, the discriminatory uh, action that has taken place. Uh, of course, discrimination can also be ongoing, so uh, they're trying to uh, put uh, policies or procedures in place to uh, resolve any kind of ongoing matters. And this is all... Uh, pre-litigation. In other words, uh, the EOC is trying to resolve it so that either they uh, do not have to file litigation in uh, federal court or that you as an individual uh, do not uh, have to file in federal court. Uh, that's an important point because uh, the EOC, in terms of uh, its litigation that it brings every year, and so, um, you know, over the last, uh, let's say over the last uh, five or six years, uh, the EOC 
on average has brought about 150 cases, uh, new cases that they file in federal court every year. That's a very, very small uh, percentage of, again, the number of charges that get filed every year. So, uh, you know, in the last year there were probably 70,000 new charges of discrimination that were filed. Uh, there were another 70,000 or so uh, EEOC matters that um, charges that were resolved with some merit. So that might have been through the uh, mediation process. It might have been through conciliation. So the EEOC does not uh, bring in litigation that many cases uh, every year relative to the number of charges that it has in the queue uh, <clears throat> or the number of new charges that have come in. So uh, the conciliation uh, is, again, sort of a, another attempt, and again, this is required by the statute, for the employer uh, and the employee with uh, major assistance uh, by the EEOC. And again, as I mentioned, this is after they've already done the investigation and they've accumulated evidence to try to work out um, a resolution between the parties. If there is no agreement about conciliation, uh, so two things can happen at that point, then either, as I mentioned, the EEOC can file a case in federal court uh, on behalf of uh, the aggrieved parties, or uh, the EOC will issue what's known as a right to sue letter. And uh, once they issue that letter, then you as an individual employee can on your own uh, file in federal district court. That's an important point. Uh, you have to have uh, exhausted your administrative remedies, which is essentially have gone through the EOC process. Uh, before you can actually file a case in federal court. And that's different from other statutes uh, that uh, govern in the employment law field. Uh, <clears throat> and as I mentioned, uh, the EOC, you know, um, files about, about 150 or so uh, cases every year. Uh, that's probably been the average uh, over the past uh, six years or so. Um, Keep in mind also, when the EOC goes into federal court, uh, even though they are filing a case uh, you know, that involves uh, an individual or maybe a class case, a group of individuals, they are acting in the public interest. And uh, that's the charge of the EOC. So uh, while they are seeking relief for people who've been discriminated against and trying to get uh, a remedy, which can include money damages. Uh, it uh, can include uh, provisions and policy changes that have to take place in the workplace. But they are, the, e the commission itself is acting in the public interest. They are trying to vindicate uh, these problems of discrimination uh, in, in the public interest in federal court so that uh, they become not just uh, something that has resolved that particular matter, which of course is uh, incredibly important, but they become an example of uh, the kinds of discrimination and the kinds of uh, practices that uh, may put people in a bad position in their workplace that uh, do not and should not have to happen. One example of that, of course, is harassment in the workplace. And uh, <clears throat> during my time at the EOC, uh, one of the uh, issues that I focused on uh, and put a lot of time and energy into was um, the issue of harassment, particularly sexual harassment in the workplace. And uh, one of my fellow commissioners and uh, uh, fellow former commissioners and good friend, uh, Commissioner High Feldblum, uh, she and I uh, co-chaired uh, a task force uh, about harassment and issued a report uh, in 2016 uh, about the prevalence of harassment in the workplace. Uh, that was uh, about 16 months before the Me Too movement took off. And that report actually is uh, a, another uh, resource that's still available uh, on the EEOC's website. But I mention that issue in particular because very often, uh, while individuals certainly uh, experience and can experience uh, some pretty egregious situations of harassment in the workplace. Uh, 
Oftentimes those cases are brought if the EOC brings them as class cases because there's uh, oftentimes more than one person uh, who's been subject to uh, that kind of treatment in the workplace. And uh, <clears throat> so harassment, whether it's um, sexual harassment or um, racial harassment, the EOC sees a lot of cases based on racial harassment, uh, are the kinds of cases, again, that the EOC is both uh, working in the public interest and uh, through its litigation program, uh, setting an example for uh, the kinds of uh, workplaces or terms and conditions in workplaces that uh, they don't want people to be subjected to. So uh, the, the, as I mentioned, the general way that a case is resolved if it goes to litigation uh, is some, it is filed in federal court and generally there's what's known as a consent decree. Uh, <clears throat> those are signed off on by the federal judge and they uh, dictate the terms of the agreement uh, between the employer uh, and uh, the employee, but again in the public interest, where uh, they may uh, include both uh, the money damages, but also in particular uh, changes in policies uh, or practices and things that have to be overseen uh, by a monitor or um, by the court for some period of time. So um, <clears throat> that's the process in terms of uh, uh, how the EOC goes about its work. Now there are other statutes uh, that the EOC uh, deals with, uh, in addition to Title VII. Uh, Title VII is, uh, as I mentioned, the main statute, and it's also uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 created the commission. But uh, since that time, uh, the EOC has other statutes that uh, it deals with as well. And uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about uh, each of those statutes that uh, the commission deals with. So one of those is the Equal Pay Act, uh, the Equal Pay Act of 1963. So it actually predates uh, Title VII and uh, the creation of the EOC. Uh, the Equal Pay Act was <clears throat> created uh, after President John Kennedy had created a commission on women and uh, that was uh, actually famously headed by uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. And among the things that the Commission on Women recommended was that there needed to be a federal law which would govern uh, payment of wages uh, to women so that they were treated on an equal basis uh, with men in terms of their compensation. Of course, we have <clears throat> debates that, um, and a lot of uh, interest uh, continuing still today uh, based on uh, questions about equal pay and lots of uh, concerns about the wage gap, particularly uh, for women uh, and what contributes to the wage gap. But this uh, federal law was first created in uh, 1963. Uh, the EOC was not the original enforcer of it. It was actually the Department of Labor, and it uh, went to the EOC later on. Uh, but the Equal Pay Act, uh, in particular, uh, is designed, as I said, to uh, ensure that uh, there is not uh, sex-based wage discrimination uh, and uh, that work that is performed uh, in the same establishment uh, with uh, substantially the same equal skill and effort and responsibility and under similar working conditions uh, that women are paid uh, the same as men. And um, so that was uh, an important law that, um, uh, like I said, was first uh, uh, being enforced by the Department of Labor and then went to uh, the EOC uh, in the 1970s. Uh, there are affirmative defenses that employers can raise uh, under the Equal Pay Act. So for example, if um, uh, there's a seniority system in place uh, or a merit system, uh, that those can be justifications for this uh, a wage differential, if there is one, uh, between men and women. Uh, but you know, you see a lot of, um, as I mentioned, uh, interest in particular uh, in equal pay uh, still today. And uh, equal pay cases can be brought not just under the Equal Pay Act, but also under Title VII. So again, the terms and conditions of employment uh, have to do with um, compensation. And so uh, if there are compensation differences based on 
I, again, the prohibited bases under Title VII, race, sex, uh, religion, uh, uh, those things can be uh, investigated by and looked into by the EOC. Uh, the Equal Pay Act um, does not require that there be an initial complaint or charge of uh, discrimination filed. Uh, of course, people can do that individually. Uh, however, the commission itself has what's known as directed investigation authority. So if the commission were to find uh, or have some reason to think that some employer uh, may be paying women unfairly, they can uh, investigate uh, on their own authority. They don't have to wait for a complaint to be filed. Um, in addition to the Equal Pay Act, uh, after, uh, and I'll go through these sort of in order, after the Equal Pay Act in 1963, the next law uh, that the EOC uh, was given and passed by Congress is the Age Discrimination in Employment Act. Uh, that was passed in 1967. Uh, interestingly, uh, at the time that Congress was debating the initial Civil Rights Act, they thought about including age as one of the uh, reasons that people should be protected in their employment, and they were unsure of it at the time, so they punted. Uh, they created a commission. They asked the Secretary of Labor to set up a commission, uh, and there's a report by the Secretary of Labor at that time. His name was Willard Wirtz which is essentially the legislative history for the Age Discrimination Act. And the Age Discrimination Act uh, prevents uh, discrimination based on age, but you have to be uh, at least 40 years old uh, for the Age Discrimination Act to apply. And uh, it's uh, investigated in the same way. Uh, you file a complaint with the commission. Uh, all of it is very similar to uh, Title VII, although there are some differences and there are some uh, important Supreme Court uh, decisions that have uh, looked at how the Age Discrimination Act itself is drafted a little bit differently than Title VII, and so uh, some of those things can come into play when uh, age cases um, are either being brought by the EEOC or uh, brought by individuals. So that's uh, uh, some distinctions that uh, people have to be aware of. Um, Following uh, the Age Discrimination Act uh, in 1967, uh, there was an amendment to Title VII uh, after a Supreme Court case, uh, and that created then the Pregnancy Discrimination Act of 1978. And so that um, put an amendment into Title VII so that uh, you cannot be discriminated against uh, based on pregnancy. Um, I can tell you in my uh, time at the EOC, it was remarkable to me how blatant uh, pregnancy discrimination was uh, by employers uh, and uh, continues to this day, almost as if you would think there uh, was no law in place whatsoever. Uh, but it is, uh, by blatant, uh, very uh, can often be the case where uh, a woman gets hired for a job, uh, a couple months later informs the employer that uh, she's pregnant and then is fired uh, or uh, applies for a job and uh, it's obvious that she's pregnant and uh, she's told to come back a year later. Uh, so uh, those cases are often uh, uh, pretty egregious and, um, and like I said, it's kind of remarkable to me how many of them uh, still happen today. Uh, <clears throat> after um, the Pregnancy Discrimination Act in 1978, uh, there are a couple very famous uh, Supreme Court decisions that happen uh, in the 1980s in particular, uh, having to do with sexual harassment. So in 1986, a very famous Supreme Court case, uh, the Supreme Court held for the first time that uh, sexual harassment is a form of sex discrimination that is protected under the law. And uh, that was the first time that happened. So uh, that's 20 years after the Civil Rights Act was um, uh, initially passed. But uh, think about where uh, we would be without, uh, where the Me Too movement would be uh, without that recognition uh, by the Supreme Court that sexual harassment is something that is actionable uh, if you are experiencing it uh, in your workplace. Uh, <clears throat> in 1990, uh, Congress passed uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, there's a 
uh, very famous photograph of uh, the signing ceremony uh, at the White House when uh, the first President Bush, uh, President George H.W. Bush, uh, signed the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, into law. And <clears throat> the um, uh, American Dis Americans with Disabilities Act uh, prohibits, of course, <coughs> excuse me, quite obviously, uh, discrimination uh, uh, based on uh, disability. And it introduced uh, two concepts uh, for the first time uh, in federal law uh, that have really been uh, transformative for uh, individuals with disabilities and uh, helping uh, people who have disabilities uh, be able to uh, access employment. Um, <clears throat> so the first uh, concept was the concept of a qualified individual, and uh, that means uh, an individual who, um, with or without a reasonable accommodation, can perform the essential functions of the employment. Um, so reasonable accommodation uh, is the other concept that uh, is new to uh, and then gets introduced uh, into the law at that point. And uh, most people today are probably familiar with what a reasonable accommodation is. So the classic example is uh, if you need uh, some type of assisted um, device to uh, be able to hear. Uh, in your workplace, uh, or if you need a different kind of chair. Uh, one of the things, of course, uh, that we, we're all seeing now in the kind of post-pandemic, if in fact we are in the post-pandemic period, uh, is uh, the option of telework. Uh, can you uh, perform the essential functions of your job uh, via telework uh, rather than having to uh, go into the office. Uh, so um, the, the whole concept of reasonable accommodation, which is uh, something that uh, if employees need uh, in their workplace, again, to be able to uh, perform the essential functions of their job, uh, they can discuss with their employer. Many, most employers today, since the law has been around since 1990, are pretty familiar with the reasonable accommodation process and uh, having to engage in what's known as an interactive process uh, with the employee so that uh, they can uh, work out some arrangement uh, whereby the employee is able to continue working. And again, the idea being uh, that individuals with disabilities uh, should be able to work and we want them to be able to work. And uh, that was a, a major finding uh, of Congress when they passed that law. I, I, uh, would also add that uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act really uh, transformed uh, the workplace uh, for all of us, uh, not just for uh, individuals with disabilities. So <clears throat> think about you know, when you walk up to a door now and the doors open, uh, you don't have to open them on your own or uh, curb cuts in sidewalks. Uh, so in addition to the employment aspects, uh, there are other aspects of the Americans with Disabilities Act that uh, we have all uh, benefited from. Um, <clears throat> following uh, the ADA um, in 1990, the Civil Rights Act itself uh, was amended in 1991, uh, and uh, it uh, codified this concept of uh, what's called disparate impact, uh, where individuals, uh, so you can bring a, a complaint of discrimination uh, based on sort of two theories. One is called disparate treatment, where you as an individual have been treated uh, differently uh, than uh, someone else, again, based on your uh, race, sex, color, national origin, religion, uh, disability, age, um, and then disparate impact. And the idea of disparate impact is that if there is some kind of uh, policy in place which may seem to be neutral, um, but it actually has an adverse impact based on race or based on sex. So uh, for example, uh, the classic case uh, that went to the Supreme Court uh, was the idea that uh, certain individuals had to have a high school diploma 
in order to get promoted to uh, certain positions. And um, this is a case from uh, the 1970s. And the, uh, that ended up uh, having an adverse impact on uh, African Americans in that particular workplace. And there wasn't really a reason for uh, having to have the high school diploma in place or as a job requirement. So uh, that's something employers have to be careful about. Well, what are those job requirements that you have in place? And uh, are you, do you really need to have them? Uh, they might seem to be completely neutral, but uh, are they actually having, uh, like I said, an adverse impact? And that uh, tends to look at, from a statistical basis, uh, uh, how that uh, the impact is being felt among uh, the demographic groups with, uh, within your particular workplace. Um, then uh, the most recent law that was uh, added uh, to uh, well, I should add the, the Americans with Disabilities Act was amended in 2008 uh, to um, uh, make sure that uh, it had it applies to individuals with disabilities. Uh, there had been some Supreme Court decisions that uh, had uh, been a little more restrictive than what Congress had originally intended, so the law was amended in 2008 and uh, signed by uh, then President George W. Bush. And then uh, the last law that uh, the EEOC enforces is the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, uh, which was also signed in 2008 by President Bush and uh, does exactly what uh, it says, which is uh, it prohibits uh, discrimination based on uh, genetic information. And so um, if you think about now, of course, how much information is available about each of us, how many of us uh, participate in things like Ancestry.com and uh, get information about our own genetic information, how much that information is known uh, about our families, uh, the possibility that uh, for based on some health condition in particular that an individual can be discriminated against uh, based on their genetic makeup uh, was something uh, as of course these technologies changed and more information became available about individuals uh, that Congress wanted to ensure uh, that people were uh, protected and that they again uh, in their employment uh, did not have uh, any kind of discrimination uh, based on their genetic makeup. Those are all of the laws that uh, are in the portfolio uh, of the EEOC. So uh, from the beginning, uh, 1963 to uh, 2008 is the last time the law was amended uh, or a new statute was added to the EEOC's portfolio. So um, really, in my lifetime, uh, that's the entire uh, uh, federal law uh, that covers uh, discrimination in employment. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, the law is uh, often uh, changing, and um, in particular, uh, there are really important uh, Supreme Court decisions that have interpreted the law over the years, the most recent of which uh, was last summer, uh, in the summer of 2020, uh, the Supreme Court issued a decision called um, Bostock, uh, which had to do with interpreting whether sex, the term sex in Title VII of the original Civil Rights Act, uh, covered uh, protections based on sexual orientation and gender identity. And the Supreme Court held uh, that, in fact, um, the, the the statute could be interpreted uh, such that it did, so that it does protect individuals uh, in their employment. Um, so the law is always, um, uh, the civil rights laws are always uh, being interpreted by the courts. Uh, the EOC has uh, been very active uh, in bringing a lot of cases over the years, uh, particularly those that, uh, like I said, will have broad impact uh, in the public interest. And uh, uh, the uh, whole concept of not having to be discriminated against uh, in our work, in our attempt to have work, uh, and 
in our workplaces, in the terms and conditions of our employment, is uh, something that we should uh, all be uh, very proud of, uh, and uh, the fact that we have these laws uh, to protect us uh, in this country. Um, that's my very brief, uh, but uh, history of both the EOC, the laws it enforces, and a little bit on the process. So um, thanks everyone for watching, and I hope this has been informative. Mm -hmm.